Hi guys. All right, welcome to section 6.3. That's the last section in chapter six and therefore completes our unit three. We're gonna go into that conversation today. And then with that, we will have wrapped up unit three. You'll have the long weekend to study and get the homework assignment done that is due with today's lecture. Um, that homework assignment is due to be turned in our first day back after Columbus Day weekend. And on that first day back on cl in class, you will be taking your Unit 3, Chapter 6 test. It will get posted by 1 p.m. and it will be open until 3. If you should have any issues with um, your ability to take that test, please reach out. As I mentioned in the announcement I posted on Blackboard for our course. Okay. So without further ado, let's start the screen share. Okay, so we have been discussing let me get this open here. We've been discussing fractions and in our last lecture, we discussed how to add and subtract fractions. We showed how uh, the concepts we discussed about greatest common factor and least common multiple came into play to help us simplify fractions using the greatest common factor to help us find common denominators uh, using the least common multiple and then being able to follow the rules for addition and subtraction of fractions, which requires that we have common denominators before we can actually proceed to the addition and subtracting. Today we're going to go ahead and wrap that up by having a conversation about how we multiply and divide fractions. This um, mostly uh, uh, most people will agree is the easiest uh, calculations that we do with fractions. They are relatively simple and straightforward. I am going to show you a couple of models of how you can model what's happening when you multiply fractions. Um, as usual, I will tell you which one I prefer and the reasons why, um, but you're always um, free to use whichever one, of course, um, best suits you or in the case where you're teaching in your own classroom um, is the easiest for your student to understand. So we're going to start out by multiplication of fractions and multiplication of fractions. We have two basic models we can use to give a visual reference of what's happening when we take two fractional quantities and multiply them together. Okay. Our first one is what we call the measure approach. You can see here that we want to multiply the fractions 1 fourth times 3. Um, and you're going to see here in this note right here, we are being reminded that whole numbers can be represented as fractions. We usually just write them like this, the whole number over 1, where the whole number is your numerator and 1 is your denominator. Because remember that numerators tell you the number of parts you're discussing and the denominator names the parts the whole has been divided into. So when you're dealing with a whole number, the whole number has not been divided into any parts. It is one part. That's why you can take the number of parts you're discussing i.e. three holes and put them over one, naming that each of those holes has been divided into only one part. So even though here we are writing this as one fourth times three, it really means the following. It means taking one fourth times one fourth times one fourth, or you can also write that as one fourth times three over one. This here will be a little more um, useful to us when we move on to the other visual model we can use. But understanding that 1 4 times 3 means 1 4 times 1 4 times 1 4, you can sit here and you can put that onto the number line and say, okay, here's 1 4 times another 4, that brings me to 2 4 all together, times another 4, that brings me to 3 4 all together. And sure enough, 1 4 times 3 or 3 over 1 equals 3 4. So this is one way of visually representing what's happening when you're multiplying fractions. And like I said, recall what we mentioned right here about how we can take a whole number and write it in fraction notation because of what a numerator means and a denominator means, as we've discussed earlier in this unit. A numerator tells you the number of parts you're discussing. The denominator tells you the name of the parts that the whole has been divided into. Since you're discussing three holes and each of those holes has only been divided into one part, that's why it's a whole. 
It's why we can take a whole number right over one and it is the accurate representation of a whole number in fractional notation, okay? And you can see that here. This is how we originally wrote it for the use of our measure model. And this is how I wrote it to the side for you um, so that you would see how we can do it while using the fractional notation for a whole number. Now, let's get into the nitty gritty of how we define the multiplication of fractions, okay? We define the multiplication of fractions. We say, let's let A, B be one fraction and C over D be another fraction where both our denominators B and D are not equal to zero. So we are not doing anything that is undefined. And then the definition states that if you multiply them together, I want you to notice that you are multiplying the numerators together to get your new numerator and the denominators together to get your new denominator. In essence, that's what the definition of how to multiply fractions means. Here is another model we can use to define just that. Now I tried to color code this as easily as possible so that you can sort of read and follow along, but for the purposes of making the understanding clear, I am gonna repeat this example. I'm gonna repeat it right here and walk you through each step, okay? so. We are in essence trying to do the problem five sevenths times one third. And using area models means that you start with the fraction on the left and you create a, a model, an area model of it. So five sevenths means that I would take my shape, right? And sevenths tells me I'm dividing into seven equal parts. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Not quite equal, but forgive my freehand. Okay, you can see here if we count, we do indeed have seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven parts. And it says that I'm talking about five of them. So I'm gonna go ahead and highlight five of them. Here's one, two, three, four, and five, okay? So you would agree that my area model right now is an accurate representation of five sevenths. Now, using the area model I've already drawn, I am now gonna try and create a representation, a visual representation of my second fraction, the, the one third. So, as if the vertical lines weren't there for the moment, I'm gonna take this shape and divide it into three equal parts going in the opposite direction so that our horizontal lines here are representing my one third. Now one third means that I need to highlight one out of these three. You'll notice that I have one, two, three horizontal lines. So I'm gonna highlight one of them and I'm gonna go across like this. And there it is, there's my one third, okay? So far, so good. Now, how do I come up with the product? Well, like you see in the diagram above, the product is equal to the total pieces that are now overlapped and highlighted. You will note that the overlap pieces are right here and that the new little divisions that have been created by me, in essence, overlaying a area model that represented the five sevenths and overlaying over that an area model that represented one third. I now have these new little pieces and I have five of them that overlap. One, two, three, four, five. So that becomes the numerator of my product. And then the total number of pieces that were created by this overlapping that I did of an area model representing five sevenths being overlapped by an area model representing one third gives me my new denominator. So if I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, I have a total of 21 new little pieces that were created by overlapping these two area models for my individual left and right fractions. And this is the answer 
to the multiplication. And sure enough, it is. If we follow the definition where we multiply numerators with numerators, five times one is indeed five. And if I multiply denominators with denominators as per our definition of multiplication of fractions, then seven times three is indeed 21. So I have arrived at the correct answer using this area model. I hope that helped to sort of further explain this example clearly for you so that you can follow along. I did try to color code it as carefully as I could on the original notes so that you can follow through. But hopefully our live, our video <laughs> explanation um, uh, helped clarify. Now, let's go on to a practice example. And I am gonna need the space here, so I'm gonna erase this part here, okay? This practice example, however, you'll notice that I have it starred in red, and that's because as I'm reviewing the notes, you know, I make mistakes just like anybody else, and I noted that I made an error in how the notes are originally written. So if you print these notes out from the content area of our Blackboard course, please make this correction on the original notes. This is written as 10 over 26. It should be 10 over 39 and in a minute you're going to see why so i'm going to ask you to make that correction this also here should not be 26 it should be 39 and this should be 3 times 13 we're going to discuss that in a moment and this is not applicable so those are the corrections i need you to make for this problem i'm now going to walk you through it so that it makes sense okay and we're going to use that area model as our visual representation of what's happening. So you can see here on my left, I'm multiplying by two thirds. On my right, I'm multiplying by five thirteenths. So if I go ahead and take my area model and divide that into three equal parts, okay? And you can do that vertically or horizontally. I prefer to divide by three horizontally, so that's what I'm going to do. So this is gonna be my two thirds. Okay, and I need to color two of them in, so I'm going to go ahead and highlight one and two. And now over that, I'm going to overlay an area model for representing my five thirteenths. So now I need to divide this into 13 equal parts. I'm going to go ahead and do that vertically. So here we go. One, two, three, four, Five, please don't mind my clearly not equally spaced lines here. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and 13. And just to double check, if we do put a little dot in each piece, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Sure enough, there are 13. So it's wonky, but 13. And then I need to highlight five of them. So I'm going to go ahead and take my yellow and I will highlight five going vertically. So here's one, two, three, four, five. Here we go. All right, so here's my five. And with this yellow and pink, it's even easier to see what pieces overlap. So according to this, since I did my five thirteenths vertically, I'll write that there. So according to this, the product should be the pieces that overlap, the pieces that overlap, I'm gonna go ahead and count in blue. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 pieces that overlap. And then I'm gonna count in red how many total pieces were created by overlaying these two area models for each of my fractions over each other. And I'm gonna do that in red. And total pieces I have is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39. So I have a total of 39 
pieces. Now, this is the fraction that I'm saying in accordance with my area model is the product of 2 thirds times 5 thirteenths. If that's the case, and I'm going to erase this here, okay, we multiply together and let's see, 2 times 5 is indeed 10 and 3 times 13 is indeed 39. Now we have to see if we need to put it in simplest form. And you can go ahead and disregard this here because here's what's going to happen. To put it in simplest form, as in our previous discussions, we know we need to find the greatest common factor between the numerator and denominator. So our numerator is 10, right? Right here. And if I find the prime factorization of 10, I hit it with a two, I get a five, they're both prime. There's the prime factorization for 10. It's two to the first times five to the first. Then I take 39 and I can hit it with a three and I get a 13th. Those are both prime. So the prime factorization of 39 is three to the first times 13 to the first. But you will notice, do they have any factors in common? No, they do not. 10 has factors of 2 and 5 that are prime, and 39 has factors of 3 and 13 that are prime, but they do not share any common factors, which means that there is no greatest common factor. When there is no greatest common factor other than one, since clearly they all would have one as a factor, then our fraction is already in simplest form. So therefore, 10, 30, 10 over 39 is already in simplest form and would not require us to make any changes to it. So please note uh, the corrections for this problem. You can see here, this is the example of how we can use the area model to help us come up with the answer. Um, and if you've got any questions, feel free to shoot them at me during the live Zoom if you see this before we get started, okay? Now let's talk about the properties of multiplication of fractions like we did when we talked about the properties of, a of addition of fractions. You will notice that the properties of multiplication of fraction, all the properties that apply to addition are going to apply to multiplication because multiplication in essence is just repeated addition. So things like the commutative property, the commutative property rather, that one absolutely applies to multiplication just like it did to addition. The associative property, and pardon the writing, it's kind of not nasty here, I apologize. That also applies. The closure property, and let's just fix that because that's just too much scribble scrabble. There we go. The closure property, i.e. you multiply with a fraction, you multiply two fractions, your answer is going to be a fraction. That's correct. It does apply. Okay. Because even if you multiply two fractions and your answer is a whole number, we can take a whole number and write it in fraction notation. So in essence, we can still refer to it as a fraction. So the closure property holds. However, there is an exception and that's what you see here. And that's necessarily not an exception, just that there are some additional properties that apply to multiplication of fractions that obviously don't come into play when we're talking about addition of fractions. One of them is the identity. If you recall, when we were discussing addition of fractions, the identity of addition was zero, meaning that if you added zero to anything, it did not change the value of the quantity you began with. So that's why it's called the identity property of addition. Well, zero is not an identity property in multiplication because if you multiply by zero, it basically negates what you started with, right? So if you started with a five, you multiply by zero, now you have zero. So it doesn't uh, maintain the value of what you started with, it simply negates it. So it cannot serve as the identity in multiplication. However, we do have an identity in multiplication and that is one. And you can see it defined right here where it says, if you take any fraction where you have A over B and you multiply it times one, you remain having A over B. And vice versa, because multiplication is commutative, just like addition, if we have one and we multiply it by any fraction A over B, we will continue to have A over B because one is the identity for multiplication. And if you see here, it's important that you note this special definition of one when we discuss fractions, because this comes into play in a little bit. 
uh, when we talk about division, okay? It also has a lot to do with how we can find equivalent fractions. And that is the idea that one in fraction notation is defined as the same numerator over the same denominator where the denominator is not equal to zero. Whenever that happens, in essence, you're talking about one whole or one. So for example, if we take 3 sevenths and we multiply it times 1, we continue to have 3 sevenths, okay? If we take 5 eighths and we multiply it times 1 over 1 and we follow the rules of multiplication, multiplication where you multiply numerators and denominators, you still remain with 5 eighths because 1, whether it's in whole number notation or in fraction notation, still is the identity of multiplication. If you look here at this problem, when we take four thirds, okay, and we multiply it by two over two. Now two over two as defined here in fraction notation is still in essence represents one. It meets the definition of one in fraction notation. And you argue, yes, but if I go four times two, I get eight. If I go three times two, I get six. So it's not the same. Well, they are the same because if you remember our conversation of equivalent fractions, four thirds and eight six, in actuality, though written as two different looking fractions, represent the same quantity. Therefore, in essence, the quantity has not changed. That's why they are equivalent fractions. Therefore, the rules of the identity property have been upheld, i.e. that when you multiply by the identity, you have not changed the quantity you began with. And we have not. Four thirds and eight sixths are multiples of each other. They represent the same quantity. Therefore, we have not changed the quantity we began with when we multiplied by this version of one in the worlds of fractions, okay? Moving forward, let's talk about the multiplicative inverse. This only exists in fractions when multiplying. That's why this is one of our quote unquote exception properties because this does not exist in addition, but it does exist in multiplication. Now, here is the definition of the multiplicative inverse. For every non-zero fraction, meaning fraction A over B where B is not equal to zero, there is a unique fraction B over A, such that when you multiply those together, you end up with one. In essence, together they cancel each other out and you are left with one, as long as the fraction is not equal to zero, okay? We call this the inverse, the multiplicative inverse, we also sometimes call it the reciprocal. You may have heard it called both. And that is a property that applies to the multiplication of fractions, but it actually becomes very useful when we talk about the division of fractions, which we'll be doing shortly, okay? So let's look at this example here, okay? Here we have three sevenths and we are multiplying it by its multiplicative inverse, seven over three. And sure enough, three times seven is 21. Seven times three is 21. This is the definition of one in fractions. So what happens? That three sevenths times its multiplicative inverse gives you one, okay? As per the definition of what the multiplicative inverse is, okay? Now, last property that applies to multiplication that did not apply to addition is the distributive property of multiplication. This property you have probably seen before. You've probably seen it looking something like this, where you've been told if A is times B plus C, this is equal to A times B plus A times C. This has been the definition of the distributive property. Well, this property still applies to the multiplication of fractions. And you can see that right here. If we take fraction A over B and we wanna multiply it times a quantity in parentheses where we have a sum of two fractions, the fraction C over D and the fraction E over F, we can distribute this a fraction that is outside the parentheses and in essence is being multiplied by the quantity inside the parentheses so that we now have A over B times C over D plus A over B times E over F. In essence, the very same thing you see here is what's happening here, 
only we're using fractions instead of whole numbers. Okay, this also applies to the difference. So it doesn't, the distributive property not only distributes across a quantity of fractions that are being added together, but it also distributes over a quantity of fractions that are being subtracted from one another. Okay, let's look at this example here. So we start with one half being multiplied times the quantity of one fourth plus two thirds. We are going to distribute this one half over the addition, the sum that's happening inside the parentheses so that we end up having one half times one fourth. And then we end up having one half times two thirds. And then we follow the rules of multiplying fractions, which is multiplying numerators with numerators and denominators with denominators so that one, four, one half times one fourth becomes one eighth. And we do the same thing here, multiplying numerators with numerators, denominators with denominators, so that one half times two thirds becomes two sixths. And now we're doing the sum of one eighth plus two sixths. At this point here, we're back to doing addition of fractions. So you would just go ahead and follow the rules for addition of fractions like we discussed in section 6.2, okay? Now let's talk about the division of fractions. Now, your textbook wants you to know that we can approach this two different ways. I personally feel that one of these ways is not as efficient as the other. You know, I always tell you which one it is. This first one here where we talk about division of fractions as division of fractions with common denominators, I feel is almost unnecessary. But we're gonna go ahead and put it in your notes so that it's something that you're aware of, okay? So according to your textbook, if we do a division of fractions with common denominators, and we let the first fraction be A over B and the second fraction be C over D, C over B, then in essence, we're going to multiply, what's going to end up happening is that our new numerator is going to be equal to A, and we're going to have a different denominator that's going to pop out. Our new numerator is going to be equal to A, and we're going to have a different denominator that is going to pop out. In this case that you can see it here in this example, we've got our A over B is 12 over 13th, our C over B is 5 13ths, and in our answer, 12 is our new numerator, and we definitely have a new denominator of five. You might say to yourself, well, where did this come from? Well, we can use a little bit of um, sort of a hybrid version of that area model we were looking at before to sort of help us understand what's happening, okay? So if we take ourselves an area model for 12 thirteenths, okay? And let's make our 13th here. One, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12 and 13. And then we go ahead and we highlight our 12 thirteenths. So that means we are going to highlight all these guys here, right? Here's our 12 thirteenths area model. Okay, so this is 12 thirteenths. And now we wanna divide it into five equal groups because in essence, because we have common denominators, what we're saying is we can ignore that. We don't need to worry about those denominators. We're gonna divide it into five equal groups. Okay, well, if I do that, I'm gonna say, all right, here's one, two, three, four, five. There's one group, right? And then another one, another group that has five in it, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. Here you go, there's another group. And then I've got these two left over. I could write this as one whole of divided into five, right? Because I've now divided this into five plus another whole divided into five, here it is, one, two, three, four, five. And then I have left over two of these little fifths, right? Plus two fifths. So I could write this as the mixed number two and two fifths. Well, let's look at the answer they gave us. If we take, if we take our mixed number and convert it into fraction notation, if you recall from my previous lecture, we would keep the denominator and then we multiply and add, right? 
So let's do just that. We keep the denominator five. We multiply five times two is 10. 10 plus two is 12. And look, turns out that the same answer we came at, we arrived at using our hybrid area model is the same answer we were given. So yes, it's true. When we are dividing fractions of the same denominator, we can just keep A, right? And we come up with a different denominator, but you don't wanna to have to do this every time to find that different denominator, right? Which is why I find that the second model or method, which they, your book lists as applying to uncommon denominators, I'm gonna show you in a little bit, can apply to common denominators too, and it's just more efficient and easier to work with. So here is the definition. When working with uncommon denominators, such that you have the fraction A over B and the fraction C over D, so long as C is not equal to zero, so this numerator is not equal to zero, then this is the rule that applies that says you can take that division and keep your first fraction, change from multiplication to division, and multiply by the reciprocal that we just talked about creates sort of a one and that the multiplicative inverse allows us to do, right? So when we do that, we end up getting the same answer. Let's test it on this problem that we just finished doing, okay? So according to the definition of what to do with fractions that do not have common denominators, we have here 12, oh, did it shut off on me? There we go, sorry about that guys. We have 12 over 13 divided by five over 13. Now, according to this new definition, it says we keep the first fraction so 12 over 13, we change into multiplication and we use the reciprocal or the multiplicative inverse. So we flip the other fraction to 13 over five, okay? And if you do that, I see right here through cross multiplication that 13 goes into 13 one time and 13 goes into 13 one time. And then if I multiply, I have 12, over five, same answer. Now, this cross, uh, cross cancellation is a method wherein you simplify before you multiply. You would have arrived at the same answer if you had not done that, okay? You would have simply multiplied 12 times 13, okay? Which, um, for those of you who are interested, I can do that for you right here. 12 times 13 is 156. And 13 times five is 65. And then you would proceed to finding the uh, greatest common factor, which I will save you the trouble is 13. So you're gonna divide out 13 from the top and divide out 13 from the bottom. And 65 divided by 13 gives you five. And 156 divided by 13 gives you 12. So you see here, even by reducing by the greatest, and remember that's what this is right here, this is your greatest common factor, okay? And we simplified, we still arrived at the exact same answer. So if you don't understand how to use this method here, which is cross cancellation, do not feel obligated to do so. You can just do it by following the rules of multiplication of fractions, which is to multiply numerators and multiply denominators, and then follow your rules for simplifying fractions using your greatest common factor. And you will still arrive at the same answer, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of that here for us, and let's go back to discussing this method as it applies to fractions that do not have common denominators, but you see how it applies and can work with fractions that do. So that's why I find that this method right here is just the most efficient method to work with when it comes to division of fractions. So as you can see here, in this example, they gave you three fourths, that's your fraction on the left, divided by five sevenths, that's your fraction on the right. They kept the first fraction, changed to multiplication, 
took the inverse or the reciprocal of the second fraction, so they flipped it, and then they went ahead and multiplied. Three times seven is 21, four times five is 20, and because 21 and 20 have no factors in common, no need to simplify, that is our answer. And 20 over, 21 over 20 is indeed the answer to three-fourths divided by five-sevenths. And you can see here that a lot of times in elementary school and even middle school, we call this method the keep, change, flip method, because you keep the first fraction, you change to multiplication, and then you flip the second fraction by using its multiplicative inverse, or in other words, its reciprocal, okay? So here's another example where we're applying it. We are dividing 6 25ths by 2 fifths. We keep the first fraction, 6 25ths. We change from division to multiplication. We take the reciprocal of the second fraction. Instead of two-fifths, it's now five-halves. And then we follow the rules for multiplication. Six times five is 30. 25 times two is 50. And this indeed could be simplified. I just left it unsimplified. But the greatest common factor between them should be five. So if we divide out five from top to bottom, we get 30 divided by five is six. 50 divided by five is 10. Nope, looks like there was another one there. We can take out another one. This looks like we can take out a two. So it, five was not the greatest common factor. Looks like 10 was the greatest common factor. So let's do it that way instead. If we divide out 10 over 10, we get 30 divided by 10 is three and 50 divided by 10 is five. And they are both prime. So we are definitely in simplest form. Okay, so you can see I just demonstrated unintentionally how it's so much more efficient to divide out the greatest common factor than to just divide out a common factor. Turns out they have five in common, but they also have two in common, and that actually gets you to the answer in two steps versus just taking out the greatest common factor, which is 10, and it gets you to the simplified version in one step. So I just inadvertently uh, modeled the whole reason why I find that doing it with the greatest common factor is just more efficient. Now, here, in essence, I'm showing you again what I just finished showing you about how we can use this keep change flip method to work with fractions that have common denominators, and it works just as efficiently. Um, as it works with fractions that do not have common denominators, which is why in the end, I, at least when I taught elementary school, I always just went straight to this method and taught this as the way to divide fractions because I just felt it was a lot more efficient than uh, teaching the first method, which was how to divide fractions that have common denominators where you then have to use a visual hybrid of the area model to sort of help them arrive at that new denominator after they accept that A will be their new numerator. I just feel like that's a little more convoluted. I mean, it does help as far as giving you a way to visually represent what's happening with division of fractions, but I find that as far as learning how to calculate the division of fractions, the second method is a lot more efficient. Okay, so you can see here that they gave us two fractions that do indeed have common denominators, two-fourths and one-fourth. They did the keep change flip method, kept the first fraction, changed the multiplication, flipped the second one, then they went ahead, in this case, they did not do the cross cancellation. They went ahead and multiplied. Okay, two times four is eight, and four times one is four. And then now they simplified, and eight over four can be simplified by simply doing the division. When you realize that the denominator is a factor of the numerator, the fastest way to simplify is to go ahead and just do the division. You could go ahead and find the greatest common factor between them, and what you would find is that the greatest common factor between eight and four is four. So then you would divide out the four from both. Eight divided by four is two. Over four divided by four is one. Two over one, as you know, is fraction notation for a whole number. So it would be the fraction notation for the whole number two. Or you could just do, as you see my little diagram tell you to do, which is notice that the denominator is a factor of the numerator and read it as a division problem, eight divided by four, as you see here, which arrives at two. And it is the exact same answer. It turns out that two fourths divided by one fourth is two over one or two. All right, guys, you have successfully arrived at the end of unit three. That's it for the notes 
for section 6.3. I'm going to go ahead and stop my share now. You will be responsible for completing homework 15, I believe, which is the last homework in unit three, chapter six. That homework will be due by 1 p.m. on Wednesday. Be aware that this is the Columbus Day weekend and you have a long weekend. You have the Monday and the Tuesday off. So officially I can assign you assignments for those two days, even though we're not really meeting in person. Um, so you will have until Wednesday by 1 p.m. to turn in this homework. And then at 1 p.m., your Unit 3, Chapter 6 test will go live. It will be live from 1 to 3. If you've got any scheduling issues, I urge you and exhort you to please reach out and let me know ahead of time so that we can make um, arrangements accordingly. And then we will be discussing the test and going over it together during our live Zoom on Friday. Um, as we've been doing so far. I wish you all the best. Have a great weekend and enjoy your Columbus Day weekend.